Hi all, in this lecture I'm going to be talking about the weak animal rights position. Um, last week we covered some objections to plausible theories that uh, the moral status of animals, of non-human animals, was equal to uh, that of human beings. So utilitarians said that uh, utilitarians like Peter Singer argued that non-human animals deserve equal moral consideration to human beings. Um, Alison Hills, in her paper, brought up some problems for that point of view. Uh, then we read Tom Regan's deontological uh, rights view that um, the rights of non-human animals are equal in strength to those of uh, human beings. And then we saw uh, potentially some problems with that view coming from Cohen's argument, although I ultimately argued that Cohen's objections to um, a Regan-style rights position were not that impressive. <clears throat> this week, we're going to uh, talk about some potential fallback positions for those who want to defend the view that the way we treat non-human animals is not acceptable, even though their, uh, the moral consideration they deserve or the rights that they deserve might be uh, lesser, might be somewhat weaker than um, those we owe that or those we owe to other human beings. So this will be the first um, crack at this with Marianne Warren's uh, um, speaking of animal rights article where she lays out the weak animal rights position. Um, and then next, uh, our next lecture will be on um, Mylan Engel's uh, view and how he lays that out over a couple of papers. So let's jump into the weak animal rights position as laid out by Marianne Warren. So uh, actually, before we get to her treatment of Regan's uh, case, I want to show you what she does in an introduction uh, because I think it would be valuable for the way you should write uh, an introduction to a philosophical paper. So let's skip down to the second paragraph here. In the first, she talks about um, Regan's animal rights view that show referred to it as the strong animal rights view in contrast to her weak animal rights view. And then she lays out what she's going to do in the paper. And this, I think, is nicely laid out and organized and something you should try to emulate in your papers. <clears throat> she says, I will argue that Regan's case for the strong animal rights position is unpersuasive and that this position entails consequences which a reasonable person cannot accept. I do not deny that some non-human animals have moral rights. Indeed, I would extend the scope of rights claims to include all sentient animals, that is, all those capable of having experiences, including experiences of pleasure or satisfaction and pain, suffering, or frustration. However, I do not think that the moral rights of most non-human animals are identical in strength to those of persons. The rights of most non-human animals may be overridden in circumstances which would not justify overriding the rights of persons. There are, for instance, compelling realities which sometimes require that we kill animals for reasons which could not justify the killing of persons. I will call this view the weak animal rights position, even though it ascribes rights to a wider range of animals than does the strong animal rights position. I will begin by summarizing Regan's case for the strong animal rights position and noting two problems with it. Next, I will explore some consequences of the strong animal rights position, which I think are unacceptable. Finally, I will outline the case for the weak animal rights position. So note how clearly she lays out what her conclusion is uh, in that second paragraph. And in the final paragraph of this, her introduction, um, how clearly she lays out the stages that her, um, that her paper will go through. All right, so with that as a backdrop, let's jump into what she wants to say about Regan's argument. So Regan's argument goes something like this. Normal, mature mammals are sentient and have a host of psychological abilities. Uh, so they are what he calls subjects of a life, meaning they, have, uh, they are being such that things can go better or worse for them. 
um, unlike uh, rocks, unlike plants. It doesn't seem that plants uh, experience their life in such a way that they're um, happy that it goes one way or sad that it goes another. They can live or die. They can thrive or um, wither, but it's not clear that there's anything there that's experiencing that uh, in the same sort, at least in the same sort of way that um, most, um, well, let's put it this way, that mammals, mature mammals are. So in that beings are subjects of a life, they have inherent value. Inherent value does not come in degrees. For Regan, it's an on-off feature. The reason this is the case is it fixes some problems with the utilitarian conception. Recall he said utilitarians don't really care about individuals. They care about um, the happiness that the individuals have the potential to bring to the world. Um, and we don't want some humans to have stronger rights than other humans. So he'll just say inherent value does not come in degrees. It's an on-off feature. All human beings have it and many non-human animals have it. We must respect and avoid intentionally harming beings with inherent value. Um, this is a callback to some stuff that Kant would talk about, beings that uh, are dignified. We can't use them as mere means to other beings' ends because they have inherent value themselves. Regan's going to extend that claim to many non-human animals. Even though they're not rational and autonomous in the Kantian sense, they do have this host of psychological abilities and they're sentient and that's all that they need to be uh, subjects of life, which is all that they need to have inherent value, which is all that they need to have these rights. So we must respect and avoid intentionally harming animals. Now note, even in the strong animal rights um, view, what some might categorize as the most extreme view here, it's extreme in some ways in that we're never justified intentionally harming animals. So recall that Regan is abolitionist when it comes to animal testing, uh, abolitionist when it comes to uh, farming animals for food. Um, all these things, he says, are never justified under any circumstances. Whereas a utilitarian will say, well, we have to look at the particular case. Um, in, is this particular experiment likely to prevent more suffering than it causes? Is it likely to lead to more enjoyment uh, than the suffering it causes? Um, so Regan's view might be posed as extreme in that sense, but note that the rights position dodges Hill's criticism of utilitarianism. Because when we're talking about utilitarianism, we were saying, or Hills was saying, that we need to maximize happiness, and if animals deserve equal moral consideration, and if it's easier to prevent suffering than it is to just increase uh, the pleasurable side of the equation, then we need to take the situation of sewer rats and red deer uh, really seriously. And if we do, now we have all these obligations to wildlife. Note that even though the rights position is more extreme when it comes to abolishing animal testing and abolishing factory farming, it doesn't have that same problem. We don't have to maximize the well-being of animals. Um, we just have to not use them as means to our own ends, especially when that hurts them. And we have to avoid intentionally harming them, but we need not prevent harm. A virtue of the right of a rights view is that um, it can propose negative rights for animals instead of um, the positive obligations that utilitarians would uh, have us have to them. Um, meaning, who's doing the harm matters on a rights view, on a, on a deontological view. On a utilitarian view, it really doesn't matter who's doing the harm or what the cause of the harm. It's about harm prevention um, and mitigating, uh, regardless of whether you caused it or regardless of whether someone else caused it. A rights position, in contrast, if somebody else is causing the harm, or the animals are harming themselves, or they're in circumstances that are unfortunate for them, Regan and Warren 
are not here to tell you you have a moral obligation to stop that from happening. Your obligation extends as far as um, not doing those things yourself. So in one way more extreme, but in another way, it dodges a really damning uh, objection to how demanding utilitarianism is. In terms of how demanding utilitarianism is. All right, so there's Regan's case. We need to respect and avoid intentionally harming uh, animals that have inherent value. So what are her objections to Regan going to be? Her objections are, uh, first, to this idea of inherent value. In fact, both of her objections are around this idea of inherent value. First, she's going to say it's mysterious. It's a non-natural property we must take on faith. So note that the qualities upon which uh, inherent value sort of rides are natural properties like um, memory, uh, imagination, uh, sentience. These are natural properties that arise in creatures. Inherent value is a non-natural property. You don't see uh, you can't do a test to see if some a being has inherent value. It's a theoretical construct, right? So um, it's a non-natural property we must take on faith. We might wonder, why does it attach to subjects of a life? Why not all sentient beings? So uh, Regan wants to say some additional qualities besides mere sentience are necessary, and they're, they're not very much, but memory... Uh, imagination, the ability to care for other creatures, uh, things like this um, are, uh, I don't know about that last one, but um, the others. Why not mere sentience? Uh, why subjects of a life? Uh, Regan doesn't explain, or at least in the piece we read. Warren wants to say value is one thing, rights are another. And why do rights attach to inherent value? So there's a couple sort of mysterious steps here. And they're the step to inherent value and from inherent value to rights. So why is inherent value attached, ride on top of being the subject of a life? Why not something else like sentience? Why not something more strict like uh, rationality and autonomy? Um, and then secondly, why do rights ride on top of um, this quality of inherent value? So um, both directions we have questions. Now, Regan is actually pretty straightforward about why he introduces this concept of inherent value, and that's just to avoid the problems of utilitarianism. So the problem with utilitarianism is it would allow us to sacrifice some beings for the sake of others, that seems uh, morally distasteful, uh, at, the, at the least. Um, so he was trying to solve that problem, but seemingly impressed with Singer's work that uh, we shouldn't be speciesists, so he wants to get rights, full rights for all human beings, and then note that those will now extend into the animal kingdom. So he solves some of those problems of utilitarianism, but he creates a host of other problems, those problems we just talked about and one more. And that's that a sharp line between um, what deserves, what has full rights in, that are equal in strength to human beings, and those which have no rights and that we can use however we please, a sharp line seems very implausible. When we look at the animal kingdom, we see uh, a gradation of capacities from uh, fully rational and autonomous adult human beings um, down to uh, shrimp and mussels and, uh, you know, uh, beings where it's not clear that there's cognition at certain points. We see all kinds of gradations going down. The fact that inherent value is on or off is very weird, considering that uh, the, all the gray area we see in the natural world. So Regan claims mammals are clear cases, and we should give unclear cases the benefit of the doubt. So mammals clearly 
are sentient. They clearly have memory, imagination. Uh, they can project themselves into the future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but then, what about cases like uh, Colbert press singer on a shrimp? Or um, what about various bugs that we would find around? Well, what Regan will say is, well, give them the benefit of the doubt. But if we're supposed to give them the benefit of the doubt, then the unclear cases are, well, first of all, what we should note is the unclear cases are more numerous than the clear cases. So there are many more bug species um, than there are mammals. So the unclear cases are going to be way more numerous. And if we're going to give all the unclear cases the benefit of the doubt, we'll be saddled with moral obligations which we can't possibly fulfill. Our ants and spiders and uh, mosquitoes and cockroaches, are they sentient? Are they, um, do they have memories? Do they, are they able to project into the future? Do they have, are they the subjects of a life in a way that things could go better or worse for them? Not entirely clear, but maybe we should give them the benefit of the doubt. And if we should give them the benefit of the doubt that they're subjects, of, subjects of, that they have those capacities and they're therefore subjects of a life, then we need to say that, according to Regan's view, then we need to say that as subjects of a life, they have inherent value. How much? Just as much as human beings. And in as much as they have inherent value, just as much as human beings, they have rights, which are just as strong. And we can't use them as mere means. And we have to avoid directly, har uh, intentionally harming them. Um, so we'll have these obligations where if our hand our house has an ant infestation, we have to try to remove them peacefully. Uh, if, um, if mosquitoes are, if are going to be a problem, we should take preventative measures, but maybe not kill them. Uh, our obligations are going to be, you know, pretty far down the road to, um, how should I put this? Uh, insanity, right? Um, so, while Regan may have dodged a demanding this objection in terms of our obligations to wildlife and um, preventing the suffering in nature um, as long as we don't cause it, he, his view is very demanding, even more so than we thought um, when we were talking about uh, animal experimentation, and experimenting on animals, and... Um, and using animals for food, that's easy enough to stomach uh, that we shouldn't do that sort of stuff, maybe, but that we shouldn't kill mosquitoes, that we should, shouldn't should kill ants and things like this. Uh, these are practically impossible. And I mean that, those words, exactly as they sound. So, uh, given those problems with Regan's view, uh, Warren is going to start building her case that animals do have rights, but they're weaker than the rights of human beings. In other words, they can be overridden in cases where it would be not okay to override the uh, rights of a human being. So why should we think that humans have stronger rights, that animals have weaker rights than human rights? Uh, she wants to talk about the Origin of right. So people are sometimes capable of being motivated by reason argument. This makes us more dangerous, more cooperative on one hand. On the other hand, more dangerous because of that cooperation. So we're more unpredictable. Since we're so dangerous and unpredictable, we need to grant rights to each other. Otherwise, we'll be uh, steamrolling each other all the time. So this is sort of... Uh, why rights are a handy moral concept. Um, she, you'll note that she's gesturing throughout this second part of her essay at social contract theory um, pretty heavily. So she'll say that human beings have what she wants to call full moral status. 
So the capacity to be motivated by reason is required for full moral status. Any being with full moral status is equal to any other being with full moral status. So there's like a threshold above which any additional mental or moral capacities won't get you any uh, more moral status because you already have full moral status. So um, this dodges an objection. Having rights tied to a specific capacity for rational thought does not commit us to thinking that the smarter a person, the more rights they have. That's not necessarily the case in her view. Once uh, a human, once a creature gets to a certain threshold of um, being able to be motivated by reason, then they have full moral status and can go no higher. Uh, so, the issue that we've run into in the past when we talked about uh, Kantian-style deontology and social contract theory was always what the literature calls marginal humans. Recall marginal humans is a technical term in the literature for human beings who do not, are not able to be motivated by reason, um, are not, don't have the mental capacity to. So we're, again, we're talking about children, the severely mentally disabled, um, and human beings like this. So Warren does not explicitly say that marginal humans have full moral status. So, um, or at least they don't get it in the same way or from the same sources that other human beings, that uh, reasonable human beings do. Um, reasonable human beings get their full moral status from their reasoning capacity. Marginal humans Warren wants to say, uh, we have practical and emotional reasons for protecting them. Those practical and emotional reasons, uh, so the practical reason, we have all been, and in the future may again be, non-rational beings. Um, so we've all been children at uh, some point, and we might, uh, if we are lucky enough to get old enough, we may be non-rational again uh, in our advanced years, or if we befall an accident. So if the if we're unfortunate enough to, for an accident to befall us, then we could be non-rational. And we would want for ourselves to be looked after in the future, and we want our kids to be looked after and have full moral status. So uh, we protect them because we care for them. And we agree, we agree as a society, I suppose, to extend free, extend um, full moral status to these beings as well, or extend rights to these beings, whether or not they have. So I, I suppose they don't have full moral status if, as we said on the last page, um, being motivated by reason is required for full moral status. We can still extend rights to these beings um, because we have practical and emotional ties to them. So we care for them, and we may be uh, like them in the future. But then the question arises, do they have direct rights or not? Um, is, uh, is she trying to go a Cohen route here, like sort of saying they're beings of a kind so that they get the full moral status? Or is it just because we agree to that, uh, like it's some sort of social contract theory? But what if we didn't? Would we be making a mistake uh, if we didn't agree that they had moral rights? That's the kind of protection I would want for them that... Um, if a theory, if even if people agreed that they didn't have rights, that they'd be making a grave mistake. But um, maybe I want too much. Uh, maybe that's not in the cards. Uh, let's read what she says here. I want to get her view right. So... She says this on page 
531. She says, why is rationality morally relevant? It does not make us better than other animals or more perfect. It does not even automatically make us more intelligent. Bad reasoning reduces our effective intelligence rather than increasing it. But it is morally relevant insofar as it provides greater possibilities for cooperation and for the nonviolent resolution of problems. It also makes us more dangerous than non-rational beings can ever be. Because we're potentially more dangerous and less predict predictable than wolves, we need an articulated system of morality to regulate our conduct. Any human morality, to be workable in the long run, must recognize the equal moral status of all persons whether through the postulate of equal basic moral rights or in some other way the recognition of the moral equality of other persons is the price we must we must each pay for the recognition of our moral equality without this mutual recognition of moral equality human society can exist only in a state of chronic and bitter conflict the war between the sexes will persist so long as there is sexism and male domination. Racial conflict will never be eliminated so long as there are racist laws and practices. But to the extent that we achieve a mutual recognition of equality, we can hope to live together, perhaps as peacefully as wolves, achieving in part uh, through explicit moral principles what they do not seem to need explicit rules to achieve. But what about people who are clearly not rational? It is often argued that sophisticated mental capacities such as rationality cannot be essential for the possession of equal basic moral rights. Since nearly everyone agrees that human infants and mentally incompetent persons have such rights, even though they may lack these sophisticated mental capacities. But this argument is inconclusive because there are powerful practical and emotional reasons for protecting non-rational human beings, reasons which are absent in the case of most non-human animals. Infancy and mental incompetence are human conditions, which all of us either have experienced or are likely to experience at some time. We also protect babies and mentally incompetent people because we care for them. We don't normally care for animals in the same way, and when we do, in the case of much-loved pets, we may regard them as having special rights by virtue of their relationship to us. So note, I have, a, I have a note here, those might be indirect rights. Because of their relationship to us, they have special rights. We protect them not only for their sake, but also for our own, lest we be hurt by harm done to them. Regan holds that such side effects are irrelevant to moral rights, and perhaps they are. But in ordinary usage, there's no sharp line between moral rights and those moral protections which are not rights. The extension of strong moral protections to infants and the mentally impaired in no way proves that non-human animals have the same basic moral rights as people. So she's here to reject the sort of the strategy of pointing to marginal humans and talking about our um, obligations to them as being proof that we have obligations to uh, non-human animals and that they deserve the same basic moral consideration and rights that human beings do. And yet, she is here to say that they that animals do deserve rights just weaker than human beings. So uh, does her analysis here fall prey to the same objections that we had to social contract theory and Deontolo Kantian deontology on this score, perhaps um, that would be a very interesting paper, and I'd, lo I'd love one of you to write it. All right, um, so do they have direct rights or not? It, from that, it's not so clear to me that they do have direct rights. It seems like they have indirect rights insofar as we care for them and if we didn't um, and if we weren't worried that we might someday become irrational then it seems like they wouldn't have rights on her view maybe she's right about that but maybe Regan or Singer are right that this marginal human problem is a big problem so if animals have rights, but those rights are weaker than human beings and can be overridden in cases where human rights could not be overridden, why speak of rights at all? 
Um, why not say they deserve some moral consideration, but um, we can, for the sake of the common good, uh, um, use them as mere means or directly cause them harm or something like this. So they're not our equals. So why talk about rights at all? The, she says, the ordinary conception of rights will not decide this issue for us because the ordinary conception of rights usually attach to human beings. Anti-cruelty views don't give animals enough protection. We talked about that with Regan, where somebody could be paying somebody else to chop somebody up that, you know, just because that person was not being cruel to the animal, they were paying somebody to be cruel to the animal, so that won't give them enough protection. And Warren points out, these days, almost all significant moral claims are framed in terms of rights. Um, if you said people have rights, animals, they do deserve moral consideration, but they don't have rights. Uh, people might immediately jump to the conclusion that, uh, yeah, we can do whatever we want to them. So if we're going to uh, be serious about our obligations to non-human animals, we should talk in terms of rights. Why not trees and mountains? Um, recall that uh, Regan excluded uh, rights to uh, species. He excluded rights to, or he would say that species don't have inherent value. Individuals have inherent value. Uh, mountains and rivers and ecosystems don't have inherent value, but the beings that make those up have inherent value. Um, so why not talk about trees and mountains having rights? And Warren wants to uh, cut off discussion of that by saying rights are granted only to beings that can experience the benefits of rights. So she is, you know, pretty impressed with Regan. That's why she takes him to task. So what is the view she comes to? Here is the weak animal rights view. Any creature whose natural mode of life includes the pursuit of certain satisfactions has the right not to be forced to exist without the pursuit of those satisfactions. So, um, animals, you know, lions seem to uh, be satisfied by hunting prey and eating the, the meat when they're not doing that sort of stuff. When you keep big cats in cages, they start exhibiting neurotic behavior. Um, on even the weak animal rights view, it seems keeping animals in cages, if they could exist outside of them and pursue their uh, natural satisfactions, is immoral. Any creature which is capable of pain, suffering, or frustration has the right that such experiences not be deliberately inflicted upon them, and here's a very important clause, without some compelling reason. So that's a big difference, that last clause between Warren's view and Regan's view. There, would, there might be some compelling reasons that we could inflict pain, uh, suffering, death, frustration on animals, um, but that's going to have to be a pretty high bar. It's not going to be, oh, because it seemed fun to us, right? Um, it would have to be... Um, because it was practically impossible, like in the case of the mosquitoes or the ants or um, or cockroaches, etc. I mean, to the extent that we could not deliberately inflict those uh, conditions on those creatures, we should not. But we, in the realities of human living require it sometimes. No sentient being should be killed again without good reason. So note that qualification. There are many ways to spell out the right to life. One is that uh, we need to go out of our way to defend a being from dying. Uh, one would be that, uh, that it's never okay to kill an animal. Her right, for her, the right to life of an animal is just, uh, they sh a sentient being should not be killed without good reason. She leaves good reason here um, up for further analysis, but we could assume that uh, good reason, w a clear case of good reason again, would be when we have uh, powerful, practical um, reasons for doing it, and 
So just living in human society would require it. Um, but I'm sure she would want to rule out the many ways that animals are abused in our society now, uh, for example, in factory farming. Finally, the strength of rights vary according to the likelihood of sentience and the probable degree of mental sophistication of beings up to a certain threshold. Rec recall that up at a certain threshold, full moral status for adult human beings. But then the strength of rights vary according to the likelihood of sentience and probable degree of mental sophistication. So this accords loosely with common sense in this sort of way. We talk more about... Um, uh, bonobos and chimps and dolphins and crows and things having um, stronger rights than we do, you know, in the case of the dolphins, than, for example, the tuna does, right? So the dolphin has more rights than the tuna, which is why they have labels like dolphin free tuna. Um, it accords loosely with that idea, but of course it won't be that idea. We wouldn't have powerful reasons to kill those tuna either. Um, but so the rights get less strong as we get to cases like um, mussels. They're an interesting case where um, they seem to devour their areas of their brain that would allow them to be sentient beings once they attach to something. So uh, the rights uh, of mussels would maybe be none at that point. So that's her view. Uh, in many ways, it seems like an attractive view. It dodges the demandingness of utilitarianism with regard to our obligations to non-human animals. It softens the edges of Regan's strong animal rights view, but still gives uh, very strong protections to non-human animals. Of course, the details go wanting here. We, uh, if we were impressed enough with our view, we would really want to work out um, which creatures have, uh, have which rights and how strong, or they have these rights, but how strong are they? And in what circumstance, what counts as good enough reason? Um, so, avoids the demandingness, softens the edges of Regan's view, still requires that we probably not engage in factory farming, that we um, treat wildlife much better, that we certainly don't use animals for furs and things like that, um, that we don't keep animals in cages unless uh, they can't live in the wild, etc. So, uh, pretty attractive view. Now, it does have potentially some weak points. Recall we talked about its reliance seemingly on social contract theory, and the question of do marginal humans have direct rights is still a little bit of a tricky um, point for this theory. So, um, but uh, I'll be interested to hear what you guys have to say about it if you decide to write on this topic for your final paper. All right, so let's get to some quiz questions. Quiz question one, which of the following does Warren not use as a criticism of Regan's view? A, his view doesn't even grant rights to all human beings. B, his idea of inherent value is mysterious. C, a sharp demarcation between beings which have inherent value and beings which don't have inherent value seems improbable, which is not a criticism that Warren employs against Regan's view. Quiz question number two. Which of the following is the best characterization of the right to life that non-human animals have according to Warren? A, the right against us, that we do all we can to defend them from being killed by other animals and even natural processes. B, the right against us that we will never kill them for any reason whatsoever. Or C, the right against us that we will never kill them without good reason. Which of those characterizations of the right to life does uh, Warren, it is best fitting to Warren's view of the right to life of non-human animals. All right, thanks again for sticking with this. 
Hopefully it was interesting. I think this is a really interesting and promising view, although I would like to see more work done on it. Uh, I'll see you next time when we'll talk about Engel's view.